Welcome to day two, AAMC. Um, I just wanted to add a few words. I, I will not belabor this, but um, since I've known both of uh, Deb and Hank for almost a decade, probably, I just wanted to add um, some personal reflections. And as I was thinking about this when Helen and I were talking, uh, it strikes me as this, you have so many, obviously, similarities. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But the things that I think um, you've both given to the field, um, Deb, with your work through as a photo historian and an, an active photographer yourself, you both uh, are both artists and people who curate and um, collaborate with others. And I think especially your work on exhibitions like Posing Beauty, which we had the great good fortune to host at the Newark Museum, um, you bring to light these histories that I think are often forgotten or overlooked, and you ask us to look critically at these histories. Uh, and Hank, um, we've known each other for a while, and um, I'm an appreciator of both your artwork, but also your social activism, uh, especially through the Collective for Freedoms, um, which I think you're doing some really great work there in kind of um, bringing to the fore critical issues that we all need to be engaged with. Um, and you also, as somebody who's both, you know, more known for as an artist, um, but also as somebody you've curated exhibitions, um, I feel like your work in Four Freedoms is, is curated work. Uh, and you both are great mentors. Um, Deb, you've mentored generations, including myself. So thank you. Um, and Hank, I know you're a wonderful educator as well. I know I see the way people respond to your talks. And so you've given so much to the field. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Krista. It's truly a pleasure to be here and to see all of you here and to see faces I recognize and faces I, that are new to me. Um, and it's just in terms of a curatorial experience, as we think about our work, we think about the objects that we treasure, the images that we transform and that we introduce to a public, and to have the opportunity to sit on stage with my son, Hank Willis Thomas, is really special. And just the idea of thinking about curating. I just want to read a quote that a few years ago that Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell wrote. The United States is in a state of crisis. Given the nature of this crisis, there is a role only artists and intellectuals can play. And I also would like to insert curators. And that da David Avalos um, also believes that our art, our culture, does not reside in artifacts, does not reside on objects, but resides within our attitudes and our ideas and our value systems. I think that's a central way um, as I enter my work as a curator, um, as well as a teacher. But in curating, we started, I could say I started as early as seven years old, um, living and in Philadelphia and going to museums, um, looking at images and looking for stories and new stories to share with my parents. My mother had a beauty shop, grew up in the beauty shop, so knowing what it meant to look at images that were transformed only also by the people who visited the beauty shop, but looking at how magazines and how posters were central to my being in terms of placing them on the wall or revisiting them in different ways. So when I think about my career started um, as early as seven years old to the point when I decided to go to art school, which was the Philadelphia College of Art in the, mid, in the early 70s, I'd like to say mid, but <laughs> early 70s, but then, uh, and my next point of moving with, a, working with a mentor, professor, um, was a curator also, Ann, T Ann Wilkes Tucker, who was at the MFA in Houston, who was really the person that encouraged me to push forward with my concept of looking for African American photographers, looking for images outside of the, quote, labored, stooped labor images of black people. And then moving on to Pratt for grad school and becoming an intern here at the Brooklyn Museum as a graduate student in 1977. And to work here encouraged my ideas about being a curator. It was really important for me to think about how images 
could retell a story. And at that time, the Brooklyn Museum had organized the, was organizing the Haitian art um, exhibition here, and they were looking, as an as a intern, I work with um, pulling together images and meeting some of the informants, but also the artists and also some of the other curators working with Karen Brown. So that, cent that was central to me and as a way of how do I enter into this history of looking not only at memory, but also looking at the current state of, of life in New York, but also in other countries. Moving forward to working at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, I was hired as a photo specialist slash curator, and I began to curate um, exhibitions there and publishing what, there. What happened in between that period? And I had Hank Willis Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another curatorial moment. <laughs> <laughs> Work so. in progress. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but when did you come across this image? And I'm always cutting my mom off, so. Right. But um, this is a moment, for me, when you came across this image right. is where I feel like uh, something really changed for you. Right. So I, in, I was teaching at Duke in 1999, and a wonderful experience. I had a fellowship there, teaching there, and was doing research on, um, also on, images about beauty. How do we think about posing beauty as a conversation? And I found this image. It's called, um, it's a $50 reward. It's a, it's a runaway, as we, as Barbara Krauthammer and I have changed to an, a self-emancipated woman. Uh, so it's seen as a runaway slave ad. And it says $50 reward, ran away from the yard corner of Jackson and Broad Street, Augusta, Georgia, in, this, in the evening, on the evening of Tuesday, 7 April 7, 1863, a woman named Dolly. And Dolly is in quotes, whose likeness is seen here. She's 30 years of age, light complexion, hesitates somewhat when spoken to, and is not a very healthy woman, but rather good looking with a fine set of teeth. Never changed her owner and had, has been a house servant always. It is thought that she had been enticed off by some white man, being herself a stranger to the city, and belonging to a Charleston family, um, sign Louis Manacolt, owner of Dolly. So I was fascinated with this image. It's a carte de visite cut in half on a ledger sheet. But what I found fascinating that I'd never read through the histories of, of looking at um, images of, of owners and, and masters saying that rather good looking. So in terms of her object of rather good looking, she's perched on the top of the, of the page. And I was fascinated and I said, I wanna look for a story to talk about how do we pose beauty within this uh, structure of bondage, but also within this experience of slavery from, from, from slavery to emancipation to today. Yeah, so I, I didn't mean to like, I, I just saw this image and I just wanted to like ask you about that. Uh, so I, I came along in amidst her, her, her period of research between the Brooklyn Museum and the Schomburg. And I think a lot of my life, I grew up with pictures like this, pictures in our house, on our walls. And my mother, in the process of uh, publishing several books, and most of the people, and most of us grew up in houses where the pictures we see on the walls are pictures we, of people we know and family members. And in a sense, people like this were family members, Gordon Parks being a, a mentor of my mom and, and, uh, and, and trying to reconcile as a, as a seven or eight year old, his American Gothic mm -hmm. photograph, I think was a very different introduction into photography and also into history. And, I think a lot of my mother's work, what I've came to understand through uh, just osmosis, really, because I was never really interested in being an artist or a curator, boring. Because you said all my friends were broke. <laughs> <laughs> and then I became her first intern, so I was already. <laughs> uh, so, so in a way, though, there was this kind of animosity I had with um, watching her, you know, struggle and, and, and help build 
careers of other artists and also try to maintain her own own career as an artist. But then um, seeing over time how actually she was helping to make history, not only through her own work, but through uh, the work that she did with other artists, which is part of the reason I, I'm really excited to be able to work with other artists because I think it takes a level of humility to recognize that you can't do it all, but then you do try to do it all. <laughs> uh, but my mom, what, what, what her work has, has done over the past uh, two decades, wink, um, <laughs> was, is that she started, her first book was called Black Photographers, 1840 to 1940, a biobibliography, which she published in, in 1986. And that book, just by the title alone, poses some questions. When you say 1840, black photographers, I think that forces us to rethink not only the history of photography, but the history of uh, African American, well, history of the United States. To be an African American, uh, like Augustus Washington in 1839, making photographs, you had to be on the cutting edge of science, um, mechanics, technology, chemistry, physics, you had to have capacity to, to either build your own camera and dark room to make the images and um, obviously be literate. And to me, that really rewrites the, the singular narrative of American history. And I think what I've learned through my mother's work is that if nobody's looking, they're not gonna find the important stories and that, and that's, that goes on. But I, 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 I embarrass you when I show you this image, but I think <laughs> it, it is, uh, that's, it's yeah. critical to this talk about. This is a critical moment. Um, when thinking about images, when I was in school, I was told by a male professor that I was taking up a good man, a good man space. And um, because all I was going to do was get pregnant, have a kid, and, and a good man could have been here. So there were only three women in the, in the class, 18 men, and I was taking up a good man's space. So basically, he was shutting me down. Um, and he was letting the other two women, and one woman actually left the program. Her, her name is Hope Sandro, who was a, who's a well-known artist today. And, and there's another, um, another one. But this image says a lot to me because I put it away. I hid the image. I hid, when, when I was pregnant, I did self-portraits. And Hank found the contact sheet and asked why I had never printed it. And it, I didn't realize how much the effect it had on me. Because of course, as a woman, yes, hopefully I will be able to get pregnant, but I was shut down in terms of the idea of reproduction that men would feel that a man who had power over me could feel that that was a shameful thing to happen. And so I've met women from and husbands who shared the same story with me about their spouses or about themselves. Women who are in their 80s who shared with me that they didn't start making art until their 60s because a teacher had said the same thing to them. And so, so fast forward um, or fast backwards or rewind, Hank and I, were we had a, a residency at the Brandywine workshop and so we decided to work with this image and think about this retitling this. And it says, a woman taking up, um, uh, uh, taking up space from a good man, and then the accusation of you taking work from a good man, and then I said, I made space for a good man. So, <laughs> so you know, that kind of reconciling this complex experience about being a woman in the 70s, creating art, and also entering into a field of a curatorial field where I did not see um, black curators. And the only black curator that I knew was David Driscoll. And at the time he was working on his two centuries of African-American art. And I, he was a professor at Fisk. And I wrote to him to let him know that I wanted to meet him and he, course was really encouraging for a young student who had no idea what it meant to be a curator um, at that time and so that's part of that experience and, the, and that was in the research for her book so this is and that's when he's still going through my t 
tons of stuff. He finds this memo that I sent. And, and this, this is, uh, so an independent research uh, request that she wrote for Barbara Blondeau where she says, uh, I found no standard art history that refers to African American photographers. References have led me to more references which were scanty. I've written over 50 letters to possible resources and had enthusiastic feedback by receiving letters extending invitations to visit special collections. And she lists 11 African American photographers, uh, many of whom uh, were actually a lot more than her professors originally had the capacity to, to talk about. And as I was saying, I came along at that period, and this is that book, uh, Black Photographers, 18. 40 to, 19, uh, to 1940, and that book led to the next book, 18, 19, Black Photographers, 1940 to 1988, which led to the next book, well, the, another book, and then another book, and 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 then, so there was, and there were several others, but, um, and, you know, I, I've had the wonderful experience of just witnessing uh, this kind of curiosity, you know, like my mother often would say, you know, I'm just a poor black girl from North Philadelphia, um, and. With I bangs, I had bangs then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, for her, it was, it was just, like, she went to the library in Philadelphia and saw that a book called The Sweet Fly, Fly Paper of Life, um, photographs by Roy de Carava and text by Langston Hughes, and recognized an absence in uh, all of the other books in the library, which was in images and stories of African Americans, not only told by them, but that actually somewhat represented um, the complexity of them as, in, as human beings in their lives. And so this is a piece that we also did called Sometimes I See Myself in You, because I'll go, because my mom's, I'm supposed to be a good man, I'll go places and try to be anonymous. And someone's like, aren't you Deb's son? <laughs> and unfortunately, I wish I did look more like my dad because I wouldn't have to like be always exposed. Like, you look just like your mom. I worked with your mom. <laughs> like, you know, what if I wanted to be a male stripper? <laughs> just can't do it. Um, and so that, so in a way, I, I didn't realize that I would be following in her footsteps as an artist. Uh, but I did wind up going to where, where she had always wanted to go, NYU for photography. And uh, this is a picture of me back then. And uh, I, I don't, I really, I don't, I don't, I, I still, I would love to go back and figure out how I got convinced to go to NYU for because photography. Because NYU was my dream. And, and so, <laughs> so I said to him that I wanted to go to NYU you fill out the application, you write the statement, and I, I knew that NYU would be the perfect place for him to go to school. He fought me all the way, and, and then- I swear that she three wrote my weeks, application. <laughs> three weeks after the first, I mean, for a mother to have that experience, three weeks into the semester, he said, Mom, you're right. You're always right, because <laughs> That transformation, because I knew in high school he was making images. He, he went to Duke Ellington High School in DC. He was in the museum studies program, which he thought was the corniest program um, to, uh, to, I guess, attend at Duke Ellington. Well, we try to go to arts high school and be in the museum studies program. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I thought it was really an important moment. But so, I mean, so early on though, when I started taking pictures, I realized I was always taking pictures with frames in them. And then I was always interested in what was going on outside of the frame of a photograph and who was holding the frame. And I think similarly to my mother, I was really interested in kind of who gets left out or what gets left out in photographs. And as I move on within my work into other mediums, I'm always thinking about, um, so this is a piece called uh, A Place to Call Home, Africa, America. I've always been thinking a lot about different perspectives and work of other artists like Sanford Biggers, who's constantly negotiating hybridity in his work. And through my work as, as an artist, I'm really often trying to uh, build off, do the visual research of my mom's, um, I think, academic research. So after Identity What, I'll often be looking into um, 
the same archives that she's been looking into and trying to figure out ways to make art from them. And one of the things that my mother talked about um, in, in when she was doing research for Posing Beauty was around the time that uh, basically su the suffrage movement was really kind of getting off the, getting, well, coming to a climax in the, in the, in the early 1900s. So these were the images that were being produced that you saw this kind of incredible animosity towards quote unquote uh, white women and the fear that they would be treated, that the men might be treated horribly or the same way that they treat the women if women got equal rights. Uh, and my mother talked a lot about how um, at this period in time, it was actually an oxymoron for a person to say, I am black and I'm beautiful. Um, and that the images that, of African Americans that were being created at that time were images like this, uh, where you saw um, the, the African American person as kind of a, a quote unquote savage or a brute, um, and this kind of com this kind of uh, suppression of you, you, you can talk about it <laughs> of the importance of um, looking at humanity and how do we re consider um, how media mediated images of black, about black people that would subjugate people and people would believe, mo the public would believe the images of, like his, um, this, these images of, of women and images of black people and how do we transform them? And what I thought with this exhibition that Hank organized was these are iconic images in our, in our culture. And how is it that these iconic images they sell products. They sell products and people also are engaged in wanting to be a part of this. You know, I just imagine when I teach a class about this, I always convince my students who would possibly work in a boardroom, how do you sit at the boardroom table and say you want to subjugate a so, woman in this manner? So this is an ad from 19, so, so through my mom's really interest in, in and t historical images, I became interested in the idea to think that um, beauty is a battleground, so to, so to speak, but also visual sovereignty, so to speak, is, is a battleground. Uh, I, I wanted to do research, and so I did a project called Unbranded a Century of White Women, where I took images from 1959, 1915 to 2015 in advertising and digitally removed all the advertising information and trying to track the commercial identity of a quote unquote white woman from 19, from that, for that century. And this is an ad from 1959, which to me is astounding because it, this is a moment when uh, women all over the, 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 the world are trying to get on the same playing field as men. Uh, this is an ad for sweaters and uh, you might wonder why <laughs> it would look like this and it, the text said, uh, men are better than women. Indoors, women are useful, even pleasant. On a mountain, there's something of a drag, so don't go hauling up, up the side of a cliff to show off our new drumming climbing sweaters. And this ties very much into the work of my mom is that I realized like these, these, were, these are the images that are, were put out into mainstream media, and these were images that actually shaped not only um, America and continue to shape um, people's notions of women's in their, women in their place, but also um, history, and we see also change happen and happen through that in various ways. But if we're not looking back at the images, we're not actually recognizing kind of how we're being influenced by really problematic ideas. Mm -hmm. So how did you become interested in creating like quilting and applique? Well, because my mother also was a quilter. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I'm like, I was, so I didn't want to go to NYU. My mom's now the chair of the photography program at NYU. She uh, got hired three years after I graduated, so I, I like to and say I, I paved the way. And I had to pay the, the tuition. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to say I paved the way for her uh, because, you know. So I could pay the tuition She was like, I want, I like, you want to get to NYU? I'll get you a job at NYU. <laughs> <laughs> um, but along the way, really, it is, has been this process of me really rediscovering things. So even my wife, who is, uh, was a curator at the Brooklyn Museum, is upstairs in the galleries right now being, doing an interview for her show. Um, we wanted a revolution black women uh, artists from 1965 to 1980, 
five is, and her name is Rujeko Hockley. And I happened to marry a curator who worked <laughs> at the Brooklyn Museum, who was born February 2nd, my mom's February 5th. <laughs> and like, I don't know, I, I cannot get, I'm mean, gonna talk about some Oedipal. <laughs> uh, and my name is Hank Thomas, my dad's name is Hank Thomas. Um, so there's like, there's this way in which I can't, I'm like, I've, she, you know, she, I'm like literally just following the circuitry. But she, because our family, many women, our family were quilters, my mother um, often was interested in the way that quilts were used to tell stories. And I didn't think it was interesting. <laughs> but at some point, I started to realize within my own work um, how I might be able to take some of those same materials and talk about different things. And I'm really interested in um, history through your work, but also because the words we the people have meant so much to me, um, but also this idea of living in the land of the free, but knowing that we incarcerate more people than anyone else in the world. Um, really, the, the, the irony, the hip hypocrisy are things that I want to develop. And so these are prison pants, uh, you know, prison uniforms, and we've created a maze that you kind of walk through um, the preamble to the Constitution, but also being given access to, you had pictures of, from Monita Sleet, who photographed the Montgomery, the Selma to Montgomery mm -hmm. march, march, and another photographer named uh, Spider Martin, his daughter reached out to me and asked me to uh, use his images from that march to, to make work, and so I made a series of mirrors. And because I think the spirit of imitation has always been part of my mom's work, I've always been interested, and my grandmother's name is Ruth Willis, and my cousin was like, you know, we're Ruth's grandchildren, so we can never be ruthless. <laughs> and there's this, uh, uh, this, that's the truth, Ruth, this, 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 this kind of earnestness that I think I inherited through m both of my parents has been integral to my work. And so my friends and I created a project called The Truth Booth, where we actually invite people to go in and tell the truth from their perspectives. This is in South Africa. But then really looking at going back through archives and photographic archives and taking images like this and turning them into mirrors, images of, I guess, American justice being enacted, um, both almost always against citizens um, fighting for um, basic, equal, basic human rights, or, but also drawing connections to that, to South Africa, um, and now taking those images and turning them into sculptures and trying to, because oftentimes when we see archival images, it seems about those people then, and a lot of my mother's work has been trying to bring dimensionality to them, and she's done that through her writing and, and her curated exhibitions, and I've done that through, frankly, taking, taking those images and making sculptures out of them and trying to find new ways for myself and others to relate to historical moments, and many people see this image about, that's really based off of a photograph of miners being strip searched into South Africa when it was presented in the United States, it was seen as the hands up, don't shoot work. Um, and images like this one, which um, should have never happened, it should never happen again, when you see them through the lens of what I'm calling the punctum sculptures, you start to recognize that it's much more related to events that are happening here and now. And so I think much of what I do as, a, as when I call myself a photo, um, a photo conceptual, conceptual artist. <laughs> uh, I'm actually um, really just taking her photo history experience and, and bringing it to a, a physical realm. This is one of our, uh, the projects that we worked on at the Brooklyn Museum with Sharon Matt Atkins uh, called Question Bridge. Did you want to say anything about Question Bridge? Yeah, Question Bridge is really significant in terms of bringing um, the concept of conversations into, that are personal conversations into a public experience. Um, one of my students said, I feel like I'm in the barbershop and I'm having an opportunity to hear all of the stories that men have experienced about their lives. Um, Hank, um, in, I guess, in the mid 90s, uh, one of Hank's professors at, from CC, California College of the Arts, asked, uh, brought a project to the Smithsonian called Question Bridge, and he wanted the Smithsonian to do a project or expose the project about questioning class and, and race with a discussion at the Smithsonian. 
Um, we unfortunately did not work with it, and I still had the video, and I'm still thinking about it. Again, Hank going through my closets. He found the video. Good stuff in those closets. <laughs> he he always felt that I needed to throw out my shoes, extra excess. So he was not about excess, and. Um, so he found this and he contacted the professor and said, why not work on a project about black males? And they decided to involve about 350 men that they met along the way to ask questions about what, it, what does it mean to be black and male? And so they created a, which was called a megalog in NEH terms, they didn't understand it. And we didn't get an NEH grant because they couldn't understand what a megalogue was, which is a multiple dialogue about the experience. And I talk about, I talk to friends at NEH to say that we need to have people who are reading the proposals, who understand new generational language, to understand what younger generations are exploring uh, when they're creating their art projects. And so that's another backstory. But, so we didn't get funding, and we continued to look for funding in different ways, um, and found funding through Tribeca Film Festival, through Sun Sundance. Open Society. And, but really, mm -hmm. what's, what was fascinating to me is that I was able to come to the Brooklyn Museum, and, um, and Radia Harper, who was Director of Education there, was actually became, a, we said we had this project that we wanted to, show African, because our struggle with, my struggle in general as a quote unquote black man is that there's a, a, a very kind of, there's, the way that we are seen is so flattened. There's, uh, I am one of 20 or 30 million quote unquote black men in America and I have nothing and everything in common with most of them. Like we're all just different people and I, what with Question Bridge was about was trying to show that there's as much diversity within any demographic as there is outside of it. And we wanted African American men to ask and answer each other's questions through this video mediated megalogue to show that there's this diversity. And so we had this footage, but we had not enough interest in people wanting to actually show it or do anything with it. And then uh, um, meeting with Charles Demaray and, and Radia they were like, oh, well, I mean, we don't know what you're talking about, but sure. <laughs> and I, it was fascinating that first, to, our first really in, real entry through being able to exhibit at a museum uh, came through the education department. And as you saw, we had you know, we, an overflow of people in the space because the conversation, even though it was a five channel, three hour conversation by the time we were done, um, it, it was an incredible, overwhelming response. And uh, we, Sharon extended it for a period and then we since taken it to about 50 museums in about 37 states and it traveled for, it's traveled in, for over um, five years and that's what I realized is the power of museums to actually ignite something. We couldn't really get funding because like there's no show so then once we had a show we could get funding and there was all of these ways in which people were able to think differently and this is, this is like we had iPads in the space where people could do their own research in this very space. Uh, we had this amazing uh, live version of the project called the Blueprint Roundtable. And so what I found within my own art practice is that you can not only just make work by trying to do something yourself, but by actually inviting other people into the creative process. And so Question Bridge and the Truth Booth really for me were a way of me kind of expanding my creative vision through collaborating with people who I know very well, taking projects to Afghanistan and to South Africa, but, and, but also the Truth Booth, we were able to t travel to 36 states um, last year. And then out of that, we also did a project with Public Art Fund where we started to take the statements, the truth is I love you, the truth is I accept you, the truth is I reflect you, and put them out um, into, the, into actually Metro Tech Center. And then we had text written in the 22 most spoken languages in Brooklyn and there was this idea that if you could learn how to say it, and we had placards that taught you how to say it um, phonetically, and if you could learn how to say one thing in someone else's language, um, you would be building a bridge and, and hopefully opening a door for um, learning and, and communication. I think that's having, I, learned, I, I went to this art school where David, David, Dave Chappelle went and, and Michelle Degliacello, it was 
in, in DC, it was, I think, um, eight people in the Museum Studies program, and there were like 400 other artists. And somehow I seemed to be the most successful visual artist, even though I was incredible. I was, my friend, one of my best friends, said, you know, what do you call people who hang out with artists? I was like, what? Photographers. And so <laughs> they always had jokes for me. Um, but what I think I learned, because they all had incredible skills and they're brilliant artists as well, and many of them have careers, but what we learned through museum studies was actual critical thinking, and that um, at 16 years old, that we were our first, 17, my first show curated, my first show was a curated show at the National Museum of American History. And we were taught how to take images and objects and, and oral, oral, story, oral histories and actually bring them into um, a physical space, into physical reality. And I think um, as I grew out of photography, because I wasn't that good of a photographer, um, because the, you know, there's now all of us, when I studied photography originally, you actually had to know a lot and now everyone here has a camera in their pocket. And so all the things that I learned in school, can, you know, technically that I love, the dark room, the chemicals, um, became pretty much irrelevant. And all I was really left with was this um, visual thinking that I inherited through my mother, but also through her, 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 her now her, her staff. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, which is also weird, having all your old professors, now your mom's their boss. And like, so like, I'm, can I get a recommendation? <laughs> um, but all, I came to the Brooklyn Museum really first, my own interest, um, with Naomi Beckwith, who is now uh, Associate Curator of Art at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. And really because back in the day, we liked to play football with a bunch of artists like Wageshi Mutu and Chris Myers. We played football in, the, in uh, Prospect Park and then would come here all dirty and sweaty on first Saturdays just to, to actually, I don't know, because there was party, because it was a party. And so my interest in art didn't, it was always, almost always um, by accident. It just came from being around like people who were- Social. Yeah, who were social. And I think that so often people are alienated from art because they feel like they need to like know this and know that. Um, but really what, what, what I've learned through my mother and through her peers who, you know, many of whom are here and many people who I've had the privilege of working with is that like we, and curators especially, are just the most generous people I think, you know, on the planet because they'll work for love, you know, not for money, um, to actually, uh, and, not for, and not for praise, you know, to actually um, help other people like visual artists often make their dreams come true and to fight in, in very difficult spaces to actually provide opportunities for new ideas that scare people, that um, challenge us in a society that is often afraid to be challenged. And I think uh, I feel so privileged to call my mother, to be uh, my mother's son, but, and it's mostly because of the people that I am inherently connected to just by looking so much like her. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so the last thing I wanted to talk about, unless you wanted to talk about this too. I would like to hear people ask questions. All right, my mom's good, okay. <laughs> So. Questions. <laughs> and then we can go back to it. We don't have to. <laughs> so questions. Okay. Hi, this is so, so amazing. And you for should me. always say your name and where you're from. So I'm Kelly Morgan. I'm the Low Curatorial Fellow at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, Deb, it's great to see you again. Hank, it was wonderful to meet you earlier. Um, I really want two things. One, I want to say that the work that both of you do is so amazing, and as a junior curator studying historic African-American artists, you both have been very, very important to me as I've come through graduate school. Um, Deb, I don't know if you even remember this, but my first year after coursework, I emailed you because I needed a copy of Black Women, Black, The Black Female Body, and she didn't email me back, she called me from her cell phone in a taxi. So, so you can imagine as a first year grad student, I was like, oh my God. Um, but listening to you guys today and that moment you calling me that day being so pivotal, I wanna ask, how do you push through the no's? How do you push through the weights? You know, when the um, suppression of the work that we do or sometimes the narratives are so foundational to the systems that we work in and the structures and institutions that we work in sometimes, you know, how do you push through that moment? when an institution says, mm, 
mm, we can do this, but we don't really want to do that. You know, or we want diversity, but not really that kind of diversity. Um, how do you, you know, not scream at the top of your lungs when you're in those meetings is basically the question that I'm asking. Well, you get hives <laughs> because you hold it in. But I don't like no. You know, I don't say no, and I don't like people to tell me no. So I will figure out ways to make it happen someplace else. And then, I mean, it has happened throughout my life as a curator where I, at, this, at the Schomburg, it was just um, wonderful support initially. And then, um, and then you sometimes have colleagues that say, enough. And so I started curating shows outside of, of Schomburg because of the enough um, and, and decided to, and as a result of me curating shows outside of Schomburg, um, the opportunities opened up. I didn't even know there was life outside of Schomburg. I loved my position at the Schomburg. I curated at the Studio Museum at the same time I was curating at the Schomburg. And opening up um, a dialogue with other institutions, other collections, because I use, as, as Hank showed, I contacted collections. I was always invited to use collections around the country in Arizona at Williams College, and so the, at the opportunity of, of the no in my institution, I would just move to another place to, with an idea that I had. And sometimes you, I wish the ideas would stop, but then you know the alternative when they stop, so then, so no, I'm, I'm awake, I'm, I'm gonna do this. So I, I, real, I believe that there, that there are opportunities to, and there's so many stories that are untold and, I, and there are so many collections um, that I'm, I'm, I'm just discovering. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see that curators and archivists are digitizing their collections now and that they're opening up a new way of access for us. Like I'm giving a talk in two weeks in Paris on black Freemasonry. And to see, I'm looking through the internet for uh, ways to curate the experience through an exhibition, a publication, and the talk. But I'm finding stories in other collections around the country. And as I travel and talk about this and prepare for this talk in two weeks, I'm finding that there are a number of uh, images from the 1880s and 60s where black Freemasons were active in their communities, building their communities, also building the idea of knowledge and culture. So that goes back to that curatorial experience. So, so my no, um, I can't but accept, I, so I just find other ways to work. I also it. think that she's always felt that her work was more important than her job. And mm. that, because um, a lot of times your boss will be like, no, you can't do that show. And then I don't know how she she just still do the show, but you know. And then people come to her boss. That's a great show. Thank, I'm glad you let Deb do the show. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, she's doing great work. And but and I think there is this like defiance because, you know, tell him what your high school counselor told you. Oh, he loves to tell this story. Oh my goodness. So what I I I have I listen to people today who've had high school counselors to tell them what they could not do or what colleges that they could not attend to. Just to think about the, um, the director of the Hayden um, Planetarium and they said he could not get into Harvard. I can't imagine that. So, but my, um, my um, high school counselor said that I would, I, only job I could get was a, be, to be a bedpan nurse. And I didn't even like changing diapers. So <laughs> I couldn't even be a babysitter when I was a teenager. So like bedpan nurse, oh, impossible. So, but, but imagine how many people that woman said that to in West Philadelphia High School and they believed it. And so, um, but because I had parents who were outside, who lived outside of work and their culture was often about my father, you know, was in a corral, he sang, and he, he had a great life, and so he introduced us to his life as he traveled around. So it's just imagine, I'm just, and Hank loves to tell that story, and, and I'm like. you went to junior's college for typing. Yes, and then I went to Pierce Junior College, 
because there was a job my father said I could always have with Goldie Watson at City Hall, and I could be the secretary at City Hall. And so having that opportunity, but that was the best experience for me to go to Pierce Junior College right after high school because I had an opportunity to learn how to coordinate, to write uh, letters, but also to organize um, collections, to organize files, to organize how to research. So that was the best experience for me and to learn how to write from that first experience of, of going to a junior college. Thank you. I always say Goldie Watson, and no one knows who she is, but she was the hottest thing in Philadelphia with a blonde wig and very fashionably dressed, and that was like everyone's goal to work in City Hall. <laughs> so I'm interested that you come from a family of quilters, and your son had mentioned that you like, uh, you're interested in the stories that they tell. And at the beginning of your slides, there was an image of a woman in an outfit with a, a log cabin pattern on it. And I wondered if you could talk just a little bit more about um, quilting, how, how it's part of your critical and artistic practice. Well, that's, the images of Carrie Mae Weems, and um, when I um, started working on the project, uh, Framing um, Beauty, I have three projects, Posing, Framing, and Exposing Beauty. Is, um, there are three book and exhibition projects. One was um, a traveling exhibition. The last one, Framing Beauty, was at Indiana University. And, and, the, and, the, and the other one was at Henry Art Gallery. But um, I, my, unfortunately, my father died. I was 41, and he was a tailor as well. Um, and he had many, many um, interests. But he had also had number, a number of ties. And because Father's Day, birthday, Christmas, what do you get, Daddy? Ties. And um, so we created a project called Daddy's Ties. And so it became a performance for us to make that, that experience. But my father's aunt um, made a log cabin quilt patterns, and she was Constantly, she had a husband who was blind, and she was actively involved with making quilts, and she was a ceramicist and all of that living in Virginia. Um, so growing up with my father's side and then my grandmother's um, side, they would also make quilts for the bed. So I was interested in every fabric and every project or every piece of, of material that they would find, they would tell a story about it and have us cut sit down and cut and and I was I'm not a great cutter or person in, in terms of precise um, slicing of images or fabric but they told stories about um, the person who had the experience with the fabric or wore um, a shirt and so that interest started in that way and that pattern and then I started thinking about um, how quilts, and I know it's been a, a controversial experience about quilt and um, signaling and helping people who were going north during the Underground Railroad. And I, and I was fascinated with that story. And to Ray, I think it's, I can't think of his last name right now, but just That's in terms enough. of Dumbar DeBard, Ray DeBard, a professor at Howard University, um, wrote a book about the hidden stories behind quilts. So I became interested in that aspect of it. But Carrie May created this piece with her Louisiana project. And she says that, um, I looked and looked to see what so terrified you. And so she's looking in terms of the history of uh, images of black people and, and speaking to the historical past that images of black people were so grotesque that she was looking in the mirror, looking and identifying her beauty, but also identifying the dresses that women um, during slavery made clothes for their mistresses, they made clothes for other women, and that they um, looked at the magazines that were sent in from Paris and around the world 
And she created this dress looking at some of the images that women in the past, women who were enslaved, that created for others and made this antebellum type dress. Well, um, well it's just, oh. Um, good morning. Good My morning. name is Marianne LaMonica. I'm chief curator at the Bard Graduate Center Gallery here in New York. Anyway, thank you for your really moving and uh, open conversation. I'm struck um, by something that I think is really a challenge for, for museums and for curators and making our exhibitions engaging to large publics. And I congratulate Sharon. I know she's here somewhere and others at Brooklyn for the work that they've done. But listening to you and also the background of your family and you know the relationship with the son and the mother and having a kind of family life where the life of, of, of the mind, of artistic production, music, is all part of your family experience. And I think the challenge for so many public museums is how do we engage with people who come from really impoverished, and I don't just mean financially, but impoverished worldviews, I guess, let's say, um, and, and to try to make those connections with people who, who've never perhaps been exposed um, to the arts and other things. I wonder if you have examples from your own experiences that you could share with us. Well, I always believe that everyone has a story and some are difficult stories. And if we could find a way to engage um, children in the storytelling moments. Um, so one I experience I had, I worked at the National African American Museum Project, which is now the museum um, at the Smithsonian. But in the 90s, it was almost impossible to think that it could happen. There were people from Congress and people who... Black and white. Black and white, and people from who had impoverished um, experience about culture who said it's impossible, black and white, that we could have a museum because there are no stories um, about African Americans that, that would warrant a museum. Black people felt it, white people felt it. Asians had their museums and, and Latino, you know, the whole experience. So we decided that we would, our first exhibition, I worked with Claudine K. Brown, who used to be here at the Smithsonian, I mean at the Brooklyn Museum, and now, and then later at the Smithsonian. And how do we communicate the story? We decided to invite artists um, from different backgrounds to, and the, the show was called Imagining Families, Images and Voices. And that, I felt that was the best way to have people enter into a museum idea, the concept of museum that possibly could, possibly could never happen, would never happen. But, um, and, and it was a battle with the Smithsonian Education Department because they said that they can't believe that people would come and that we would have a show with black, white, Asian, and Latino artists into a space um, that it was the, in the Arts and Industries building. But what we learned from that experience, even with the, which I love the report that the education department did, was that they got it. That was the first words. Uh, the first line in the report, they got it. Who the they, I'm not sure. But what I found it really is important to watch people walk through the museum to say, have the experience of these are different stories, these are difficult stories, but there were stories that warranted a discussion, and that's how we entered it. And then the school children who were there, they brought their parents back. And so the, what we learned from children, and I think when Hank has the experience of working with the clothing, that when he mentioned how many men and women are incarcerated, we think how much money we could spend to education. If we educated the people and had, gave them opportunities, that reversed experience um, could happen. And that's what I think that encountered my experience of how people encountered a story that they were unfamiliar with 
and to open up that, that work. I'm thinking about Krista. She has a project that I am, I am in love with because she's working on a project of a woman who went to South Africa in the 30s um, looking for a way to collect and to learn about the histories of, of black people in Africa, but also taking that material back and opening and helping the Newark Museum open up a collection of African art. The, you know, that's, imp that's impossible for, in that time period, for a woman, uh, a black woman, to think about um, opening up a space where she could educate people about Africa outside of the Tarzan movie stories, you know, outside of that experience. So I think that if we can find a way to um, open up stories and to create um, new ways to dialogue with uh, with younger people and older people and, and open up that, that experience. I think it's all about breaking the rules and inviting more people into the space. And I think um, that's the thing that I learned from both of my parents is that it's okay to, 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 it's easier actually to invite more people in than to try to like cut people out. And institutional collaboration is critical to that. And so with uh, Four Freedoms, a project I was gonna talk about, which is a, a collaboration with several other artists where we've been go, try, we're trying to get people invested in political language and um, being actually creative citizens because we think that our, our political our, our political um, institutions need new creative thinkers. And so we started a super PAC as a way to, uh, as an art project, as a way to kind of really invite uh, the art world into the political discourse. But also uh, the Truth Booth, which is a co collaboration that I worked with, uh, uh, the Mott Walsh Collection and the Cranbrook Art Museum and Stephanie and, uh, and Laura Mott and uh, was able to, uh, actually go to 14 sites around in Detroit and Flint, Michigan, and actually by bringing the truth booth to the sites, to the Hispanic Cultural Center and to other sites, we were able to actually invite people who would otherwise never go to the Cranbrook Museum or go to other museums in Detroit to actually be a part of an art project. And actually, so they're in the galleries, which might lead them to come to see themselves and tell other people about the stories, but also have them in conversation with people who they may not ever talk to and engage in. And so I think fundamentally this explosion in social practice that's happened in the fine art world over the past uh, several years is really a neat uh, part of the, uh, one of the best tools for people to actually uh, to bridge those gaps. So I know um, we might be near the end of our, our time. Right. There's one more question, sir. Uh, hello, my name is Nancy Burns. I'm at the Worcester Art Museum, and I have to admit I'm a little bit nervous to ask the question. This question. That, that's the that's the archive that that I just discovered the other day. And we just and met you need the to Perskis. talk about that too. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> I this is a little bit hard to ask, which okay. is. I'm uh, wondering how you feel about white curators writing the visual histories of African-American images, African-American art. There's a desire to be more inclusive in the, the museum, but there's also a discomfort I personally feel in being a white curator that's doing exhibitions of black artists or representations or writing histories of black sitters. And I mean, the reason I think about this, well, I think about it a lot because it is on my mind, but you know, you look at images of six white men that are deciding women's health in, in, for you know, the entire country. How do you feel about white curators writing black history? I don't have a problem with it. Well, that's and, nice, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, we've learned that um, white and black and Latino and Asian curators have ways to enter into a history and to tell the story. Um, we know that there are um, people who don't understand, uh, are unfamiliar with stories, and I think the research is out there. I, I don't, I'm excited about the, I've, opportunity that the 
the Art Institute in Chicago is doing a, a Charles White show that hasn't, has not been a Charles White show since um, 1982 or 83 at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And there are white curators who are organizing it. And without that support, um, I can't imagine if white curators aren't writing it and they're not, you can look mm -hmm. around the room here, how many black curators in here, who's going to write um, about the art in the museums? And I think it's really important to, to do that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, fundamentally, I think it's, we, the one issue is that you can't do it timidly. You know, we have to acknowledge that we're going to make mistakes, we're going to say things, we're going to sometimes uh, say things or do things that hurt people's feelings, but if we avoid that, we're not, we can never bring the conversation forward. I've dealt, I, I'm a professional at putting my foot in my mouth. And I think, um, but seeing me kind of own that, I think has helped other people be more willing to, to actually open up and, and, and say and do different things. I think there also, there's a, a, I think a false assumption that quote unquote, black people can't be ignorant about black history and black culture because most of us have been taught the same lies and read the same foolish myths and um, it takes a special person to be able to look beyond that and dig, do the work to dig, um, and try to go out on a limb to say things that are, are, are new or provocative and that, that challenge what we think we know. And I think um, we can't let anybody tell, like I, I say, you can't tell what color I am by looking at my skin. You know, my, they say I'm black, but I'm clearly brown, so there must be a lot more detail to that conversation. And so I think this, I think that the danger of being afraid to be called out because you might have done something or said something wrong, the best way you can do it, I like focus groups, so I'll go to certain people and say, like, is this stupid, is this sexist, is this racist? So at least if I'll hear it in advance from people who, you know, um, and I'll, I'll ask them that, those specific questions, not like, what do you think? You know, it's like, just tell me, is because I think it might be bad, and, and I feel like if I'm, if I still want to do something knowing the risks, then I feel like I might really be, be, be somewhere. I think we know, all know about what happened at the Whitney, and I think the challenge wasn't the work. It was more people not really being able to deal with the intense um, issues around that. that like, the, it, it was a great opportunity to actually talk about, like, why does so-and-so have the right to tell so-and-so they can't do this and do that? Um, but instead, it became this positional thing, and I think it's super important for us to um, be willing to stand up for whatever we believe and um, be willing to also be wrong and, and own up to that and, and maybe mature and grow from that. But, but before, I'd like for you just to say something about that collection, and then we can end, because I really think it was just an important find for me and the range of images in that collection. Extraordinarily right. briefly, uh, there's a vernacular photographer named William Bullard whose work was recently discovered. He had 5,400 negatives. 300 of them are representations of African Americans and Native Americans from uh, Massachusetts. But what was quite extraordinary is that Mr. Bullard detailed the names of all the people in his photographs. So we've been able to go back and trace the descendants and find out where, what these people did, what their stories were. I don't want to exaggerate, it's about 85% of the people were identified. And so um, I think that it's really a unique group to be able to tell the actual stories of the African American and Native American sitters. And, and what's, what's so unique about it is the one of the family members. Um, there is a TV show, for those of you who were, um, oh, um, yeah. when I was younger in the 50s, called This Is Your Life. And um, one of the sitters is a family member in the photographs of the woman who was an enslaved woman who was in 1956 on that This Is Your Life um, TV episode that if you can find it, let me know because I'm looking for it. Because you have it on your website? Send it to me. Because I can find it in the, on the links. But it's, it's just important to think about as we research. Like if we, if I, I teach a number of students and, and I want them to curate and look for different stories to tell, 
and and I and I want that diversity to happen. And I think it's important to even consider how uh, a woman at 95 who was enslaved was on a game show, <laughs> but also her story was was shared um, about a woman who survived slavery. But also um, to your question, I see Catherine Morris standing there with my wife, Rujeko Hockley, um, <laughs> who um, neither of them are African-American, um, um, but they did this incredible show um, that is on the fourth floor. Um, and, um, and I mean, and they, it was about black feminist artists. I mean, and I think it's really amazing show. And I think the people who participate, I only hear the good side because it's my wife. But, you know, it's all, I've, I've heard nothing but great things about the show. And I think it's all about, like, being willing to go out there and do the research and do the work. And I hope you guys get to see that show. And, on the, and my, my plug that I have to put out there for Four Freedoms is that we really, 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 really want to find a way to work with every one of you. Um, and Michelle Wu, who's one of my collaborators, is here. Um, and I know it's complicated to talk about politics, but we aren't interested in alienation politics, but actually United States nation politics and trying to find uh, the us is them, that they are us, and broaden and more, bring more people into the conversation. So thank you all for having us. Thank you.